Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining our You Had Me at Pino session as part of our German Wine From Home series. I am the Danielle that's been sending you all the emails. So thank you all for bearing with all of our communications and for attending again. Um, today you'll be hearing from Brent Kroll and Nikki Lang from the Maxwell Park team. You will also be guided through this series by Renelle Z Zellweger and Tom Cruise. Um, if you haven't noticed already, the You Have Me at Pino is a play on the line from Jerry Maguire. Um, so be on the lookout for some fun ads from the film throughout as well. Uh, if you have any questions during the panel, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen on the gray toolbar. For any more general comments or tasting notes that you want to share, please use the chat function in opposed to the Q&A. Uh, with that being said, looking forward to tasting with you all and excited to introduce officially our two hosts for today, Brent and Nikki. Awesome. All right, uh, Nikki, you have the slides ready. Uh, thanks for having us on too. We're really excited to be here and talk about these uh, German wines. Uh, with Nikki coming live from Maxwell Park. I'm in, currently in a field right now. Uh, let's see, so Wines of Germany and Maxwell Park presents You Had Me at Pino. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen uh, Jerry Maguire, uh, you should still find this funny even if you don't get the references. It's a great romantic comedy with a nice uh, uh, intertwined sports uh, under theme into it. So I definitely suggest checking that out at some point if you haven't. Um, but on to what we're all here for, which are uh, German Pino. So the class agenda, uh, we're going to talk about like what is Pinot, uh, different types of Pinot, uh, history of wine in Germany a little bit, and then uh, our four wines that uh, a lot of you will be tasting with us uh, today. Uh, leading off the cell back, Worcester uh, Pinot Blanc from the uh, Mosul. So it's like, that's kind of a cool uh, under the radar find. Uh, this is about 1.5% of production roughly at cell back Worcester from the last stats that I have. So. It's not their bread and butter, but it is a phenomenal winery and something really cool to see. The Becker, if you have it, almost comes across as like a extended skin contact, almost like orange wine. Uh, Pinot Noir Rosé, uh, I know a lot of times this is like more confusingly referred to as like Schmeberg under vice syrups, which like isn't super easy to digest. Rebholz is like super famous for their age-worthy reds, but their Rosé is super dry and refreshing, uh, where some Schmeberg under vice syrups I've had can tend to be off dry. And then we have the Schmidt uh, Pinot Noir, which is super kind of uh, earthy or herbaceous and really uh, I think people expect Pinot Noirs to be more from like Balz or Baden or something like that. So you're going to try to see it from Rhine Essence. These are all, I think, very uh, unique polls today that we're going to be going over. <clears throat> so what is a Pinot? Uh, Pinot is a grape. It's a very, very old ancient variety, over 2,000 years old. Uh, most importantly, it is the great granddaddy of most grapes. Um, it offspring are some of the most popular and influential and um, international grapes in the world. Uh, so a very, very important grape. Um, the prototype of Pinot was most likely a wild vine um, and very susceptible to mutation. Um, so the word Pinot, uh, the name was possibly derived from pin, meaning pine, because the clusters resemble a pine cone, or from the place uh, where the first cuttings came from, called pins or pinoles. And so Pinots are actually have the exact same um, identical DNA profile. So Pinot Meunier, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, which is also Pinot Grigio, and Pinot Blanc are basically the same um, grape. The only difference is the outer layer, the skins uh, have a genotype mutation. And so a lot of the flavor and color and characteristics of these grapes come from the actual skins. Um, and that's what makes each grape unique. It's, I think a lot of people too don't necessarily realize that like uh, if you saw the uh, Pinot Gris grape, it's like a red grape almost that you can see in the grocery store and that can't quite make like red wine, but it has to be kind of that darker uh, color. And then the Pinot Noir grape is even darker in color than the Pinot Meunier grape, which makes like really lightly colored uh, vibrant uh, red wines. Uh, also, uh, for all of you who study uh, 
Oh, yeah, I think you have it. No, no, you don't have that in here. Um, the uh, Henri Gouge in Nuit Saint George, he had like a Gouge Blanc where it kind of like mutated within the vineyards. So sometimes these new mutations. I think we're going to get into clonal stuff a little bit later too, which is kind of interesting. But that definitely has an impact on color. Sorry, back to you. And so here is Tom Cruise trying to, to explain exactly what a Pinot is. And so the best way to uh, outline it is um, the Pinot family tree. So it is the most complex of all grapes. Um, Pinot cross with the Guablanc Blanc um, gave forth to all of these uh, international varieties and the most important grapes, as I mentioned before. So offspring like Chardonnay, Aligote, Muscadet, um, which the grape is Melon de Bourgogne, and um, the grape of Beaujolais, which is Gamay, are some of the most famous and um, prestigious wines in the world. Uh, so here is the Pinot family tree. So Pinot Noir in specific, um, along with Gua Blanc, gave forth to all of these um, incredibly important and prestigious grapes. So Gamay, Chardonnay, Aligote, Auxerrois, Melon de Bourgogne. And Pinot is also uh, the father of Sauvignon. And so this is a very ancient uh, variety as well. And so important that it um, gave forth to international varietals like Sauvignon Blanc, Brunner Veltliner, Cab Sauv, Cab Franc, Merlot, um, very much the most important grapes um, today. And so a little bit of history here. Um, how did Pinot get to Germany? And so the Romans brought the Pinot plant um, or Pinots in general to the Mosul um, when they were settling in um, to the area. So this was back in 100 BC. Um, and then in med medieval times, the Cistercian and Benedictine monasteries, um, they are who categorized and classified all of the Burgundy vineyards um, and brought organization and structure um, to the wine world settled into Germany. And so during this time is when the actual Pinot grape was brought to Baden from Germany. And so this is especially important um, because Riesling didn't even show up uh, in Germany or was on the map until much, much later, until 1435. And so that's when the spread of Pinot Noir continued throughout Germany. Um, and these uh, monasteries, um, especially Kloster Eberbach, um, and here is a picture of their uh, calves, um that it still exists today, um, extremely ancient. And uh, they actually started um, to spread and really put a focus on Pinot as a grape. And so later on, the first planned um, botrycized Riesling grapes, also by Koster Eberbach, who was extremely influential um, much later. The prices of wines in Germany started to reach um, the price of the first growth Bordeaux um, in the early uh, 1900s. And so Germany was really um, starting to grow and establish itself as a major and prestigious wine producing country. Um, more of the modern um, wine laws and structurings in 1971, which is what we talk about today. And then 1985, uh, Germany became popular in the US with Blue Nun Sales, which was this very sweet Riesling based wine um, and actually gave forth to um, Germany being known for sweet and not quality or premium wine. So that- Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I feel like with that too, it's kind of like, that was the era of like Lancers and and all these kind of like sweet wines taking over like in the u.s it was kind of like the top 10 wines sold in the country in like the 70s and 80s were all kind of like cheap sweet wines and this is the one where people associate it with germany and it kind of like i think messed germany up in a way it's still kind of coming out of because that was when everything was related to sugar levels and 
and uh, more so based on hematic acid instead of like vineyard sites and stuff like that. So you're looking at like sugar levels based on kind of like price and quality and stuff like that. Uh, this is so ironic. This is my personal vintage that Blue Nun came out. If I could find a birth year Blue Nun bottle, that might be really terrible or really good. I have no idea there. Uh, but I think also Elbling's a cool one that predates Riesling too, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, cool, uh, you know, cool other grapes to look at as well, even though, you know, such as these, uh, but moving on. Yeah, actually today, um, Germany is the largest uh, consumer of sparkling wine production in the world, which Pinot Meunier, which is another um, mutation of Pinot, uh, has gained more popularity. Uh, they're making sect which is the uh, classic sparkling German wine uh, from 100% Schwarz Riesling, which is 100% Pinot Meunier. And I think the flowers want to keep an eye on the late bottle of uh, scorchment type stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but moving on. And so Pinot Blanc, um, the white mutation of Pinot um, in recent years has grown to be the largest producer um, of Pinot Blanc is Germany. And uh, in Alsace, it is famous for being blended with um, Auxerrois. Um, and so in the 1980s, uh, Pinot Blanc gained more popularity, um, especially in Northeastern Italy. So several names um, are attached to the different Pinots. And so it's important to know um, which one is which, so you know what you're drinking or what you're looking at. Um, Weissburgunder is what Pinot Blanc is called in Germany, Pinot Bianco in Italy, and Clevener in Alsace. And so the main characteristic of Pinot Blanc is uh, that it has a certain roundness of flavor, verging on apparent sweetness, sometimes because the acidity is relatively low. And that's a quote from James S. Robinson, and I think it just hits the nail on the head. Um, a lot of times Pinot Blanc has been called uh, the poor man Chardonnay because it's not as prestigious as the Chardonnay grape, um, but you can get it at a much uh, approachable, it's much more of a value wine, um, but has a lot of the similar characteristics. I think it's been mistaken for Chardonnay in vineyards too. And this has kind of like a nice like lime undertone. It's really nice that I don't always get from Pinot Blanc. Oh, and then Nikki, you want to yell this or am I? I think he should yell this. Show me the money. Uh, and on to the first one. This is the Belbagoster Pinot Blanc yeah. from the Mosul. Brent, do you want to talk about this wine a little bit? Yeah, so uh, Selbachoster, they're not too large of an estate. I think uh, in my notes, I have them at around 18 uh, hectares, um, but they have some really nice uh, vineyard sites kind of along the Mosul. Uh, this is coming from uh, Hemmelreich, and sorry, my, my German isn't very good, even though my last name's kind of like German. I can't even like pronounce that fully properly, so give me a little bit of uh, forgiveness as I go through this. But also, uh, uh, Weisberg under, a lot harder to digest, so it's nice to see them putting like, you know, block on a label to make it more like uh, digestible. I think a lot of times some of these uh, German words you can get hung up on and stuff like this. But for me, this is... Uh, where some Pinot Blancs are very like golden apple and kind of like fat and they feel like really ripe, like on oak Chardonnays. This actually is medium body, medium plus an acid gearing towards high, nice kind of like uh, minerality and like a lime undertone. Uh, I get some light, like icicle and like floral notes and stuff like that. But this is just super, super crisp and refreshing more so than, you know, what I typically expect. Um, and the Selbach Oster, most of my experience has been with the Rieslings, which are super, super age-worthy. Uh, the family's been around, as you can see on the bottle, for, uh, for over 400 years. So definitely lots of generations. Right now it says Johannes uh, Selbach. Um, what are your thoughts on the wine? Yeah, uh, it's a very classic and traditional producer, uh, more of a non-interventional approach as well. And so um, it's really interesting that 55% of their vines are on original rootstock. Um, and so um, they have deep roots and most of their vines are south or southwest exposure. Um, that's really important in Germany because it's such a marginal climate. It's a very, very cool 
um, climate and especially for grapes like Pinot Blanc, um, more so than Riesling, they need more of that heat um, to fully ripen and fully develop. And so, yeah, this has really nice tropical fruit to it. And um, yeah, it really jumps out of the glass. It has nice intensity and good acidity. Um, good patio wine for the, for the beginning of fall. And this too is also uh, one of my first times trying this wine. Like I said earlier, 98.5% of their production is Riesling. So this is just, I think, kind of a fun side wine compared to like their uh, bread and butter. They're mostly known for. And so here is where uh, the Mosul is on the German map. Um, and so much further north compared to the southern part where the rest of our Pinots are from. This is much more of a warmer climate down here and where the Pinots really excel. Um, and so this is a bit further north. So that's where you get all that um, nice acidity and minerality in the wine. And here is um, how twisty uh, the Mosul is. Um, and so extremely, extremely steep slopes up here, um, some of the steepest in the world. And so because this river is um, so jagged and goes back and forth, you get really, really extreme exposures um, and extreme terroir, uh, which translate into a more expressive and intense wine. Still need more Pinot? Who's coming with me? There's a fish in the bag. Today's all we're with them too, but also the goldfish. Those are the only things. All right, and so Pinot Gris is the next Pinot um, we'll focus on. And so Gris means gray, and it's mostly because of the color of the skin there. Um, Germany is the third world production after Italy, where it's Pinot Grigio, and then the US, where it's more popular in Oregon. Um, and so synonyms for Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio in Italy, Pinot Gris in France. Germany has several different um, for Pinot Gris. So Ruhländer, Grauburgunder, Grauer Burgunder, or Grau Klebner. Um, and so the characteristics of this grape is it is early budding, mid ripening, and it is the most resistive resistance to uh, pests and diseases. Um, Pinots in general have a thinner skin, and so they are more susceptible to botrytis and gray rot, um, which is important. They need a much uh, drier climate. Uh, so on to the next slide. This spends uh, five months on the leaves too, which I think yeah, you've got all that, or no, you don't have that in there. So um, it's macerated for uh, 12 to 18 hours too. This is kind of, for me, almost like rosé slash orange wine. I think that like when you get Pinot Grigio, when it's at its worst, it's nicknamed Patio Grigio and they're making oceans of it in Northeastern Italy. Um, this, this is not that though, even in terms of like natural, like um, acid like grams per liter, this is higher than Pinot Grigio normally clocks in at. Um, residual sugar, you have 1.7 grams per liter. Uh, that's, I mean, you're not supposed to be able to perceive on the palate under four but this definitely has kind of like a sour and more like bracing acid than typically you'd expect from Pinot Grigio, which can sometimes just be like green apple phenolic bitterness and kind of like nobody's home. Um, but this would be really cool with like a high acid uh, food dish uh, kind of pairings. Uh, and this is kind of showing where if you're looking for some, you know, like maybe more hipster wines that are kind of more in like a like natty type style. I mean, this could fit the bill, but then also not be like weird and cloudy and like unfinished like some of those wines can be. So I think this is like a very, very uh, unique example of uh, the, the grape. And so a little bit on the region, the faults is um, over here. Uh, Again, Western Germany, but this is um, right near Alsace. And so where Alsace is down here and it has the Vosges mountain range, the Vosges mountain range continues up north into Germany um, where it's called the Hart Hills. Um, and so it is very similar to Alsace in style. Um, so lots of different soil types. 
And Pinot Gris, which is also a very classic grape, is uh, works really well here. And as you can see on this map, it is down in the very southern end, right near the border of Alsace. And for all of our favorite grape, Pinot Noir, we have two wines for Pinot here. So this is cool to see um, the different styles of how uh, Pinot shows in the glass. I've heard the 777 clone get kind of knocked around a lot because it's often used in like California to make like super uh, dark Pinot Noirs. Uh, typically like Dijon, uh, like Burgundy and Champagne clones are like I think the most wildly used and uh, most respected and stuff like that. Uh, so it's cool what is going on in Germany with the Pinot clones is that since it's been grown there for a very long time, the clones have uh, developed um, to be their own specific style. Um, and so there are several German clones. The main ones are Geisenheim and Freiburg. Um, and then the most popular uh, French clone is the Dijon clone. And so this goes back a little bit to um, the history where after World War II in the 1950s, uh, more of the modern style um, Pinot Noir came about and they were called standard clones. And standard clones had very tight bunches. Um, and what happens there is uh, it can lead to a higher must weight and higher yields, which is really bad for Pinot Noir. And so uh, they are more susceptible to rot because the bunches are so clustered. And so must weights and yields are extremely important to Pinot Noir. So for example, Cabernet Sauvignon can produce great wines around 50 um, hectoliters per hectare, um, where Pinot Noir is only good when it's less than 40 and really great Pinot Noir is less than 30. And so it's mainly because of the thin skin of the grape um, where it gets most of its flavor from um, and the juice Skin ratio. And so Pinot Noir meaning black um, or Spe meaning late, it's a late uh, ripening grape, um, which is why it's such a finicky and um, testable grape. Uh, so other uh, words, names for Pinot Noir, Spapburgunder, Blauburgunder, or Blauer Klubner. Um, again, rising in popularity in the world, Germany is number three after France and the U.S. Hey, Nikki, I, there's a couple questions asked. I'm going to, I think, answer the one that's more fun for me and turn the other one over to you, which I hope you don't mind. Go for uh, it. <laughs> of course. Uh, so one person asked, how does German Pinot Blanc differ from Italy and France? Um, Typically, uh, when I see it in France, it's from Alsace, and Alsace is like sun drenched. So these wines tend to be kind of like fat and honey. Um, typically, when I see them from Italy, it's northeastern Italy. A lot of times they tend, well, I, I guess sometimes I see them barreled up, and sometimes I don't see them barreled up, but they take on more of like an unoak Chardonnay approach, like that I was referencing earlier. Kind of like uh, to me, oftentimes they can remind me of like unoaked California Chardonnay, but like in balance. This, however, is like lean, more crisp, like bracing. Uh, Nikki said some like tropical notes. I'd say they're like underripe tropical notes and like some lime zest. But I would say this is truly unique. This has higher acid and definitely like a leaner um, like build to it. Being a much cooler place than, uh, than where it's grown in Italy and all of uh, Nikki, the question for you. Someone just asked, what is Marley Loan? Marley loam. And so um, marl is more of, it's kind of like a dirty clay. So there uh, has a higher percentage of limestone in it. And loam is more about the texture of it. Um, and so uh, it has a mix of limestone that gives more of that kind of chalky uh, minerality and drainage to clay, which is uh, water retentive and heat retentive. So the mix is really good for um, grapes that need uh, that kind of drainage, but also need more of the nutrients in the soils. 
Isn't there some crazy stat like around ninety percent of like soil contains like some form of loam in it? Like, isn't it's like uh, the most like widely I don't think uh, soils that there are? Yeah, I guess it's more of a mix of the topsoil and um, what is underneath. So the topsoil will typically maybe have more clay, and then the limestone will come up from underneath. Do you want to actually? Why don't you take this slide and weigh in on your thoughts on it, and then I'll get into it as well. Okay. Yeah. So um, Revolt's Pinot Noir Rosé, uh, super delicious, very light and crisp. I got a little bit of a spritz to it. It is under Stelvin or the um, screw cap, um, which helps maintain all of that freshness and. Uh, brightness in the wine. And they are biodynamic, um, which is fun more and more uh, estates in um, Germany are becoming Demeter certified. Um, and right now, Germany is the third uh, highest number of Demeter certified wineries in the world, um, which is especially interesting because it is such a tough climate to um, grow grapes in. Um, and so 100% stainless steel as well. This is 0.2 grams per liter of sugar. Um, and as Brent mentioned earlier, uh, your palate cannot detect um, anything below four grams of residual sugar. So even though the nose on this is very ripe um, and sweet, uh, it can really trick your brain into thinking there's sugar in the wine where there is basically no sugar. I mean, the alcohol is also low. If I saw 11% alcohol, especially from like the palate, which is like, potentially more in common with like Alsace and other regions in Germany in terms of climate, I expect the alcohol to be like a little bit higher. But I guess that like the, the trapped gas or like the little spritz, um, this doesn't seem like it's related to racking. It seems like it's just like an early harvest. And they're just getting a bunch of freshness. And this is like, I would say 2019, like right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. um, Pinot Noir is though a high acid grape. So like the acid checks out. In terms of the sugar, a lot of times when I've seen Pinot Noir rosés from Germany, they're not, they're like, dry but not this dry this is like just bracing with a little spritz to it and i think if you're comparing like famous pinot noir rosés around the world you probably look to like the u.s or like sancerre rosé or something like that um this i mean has a ton of personality i feel like this would be like for me uh like sancerre rosé lover meets chocolate rosé lover and it doesn't have the madness or alcohol of california being indicative to like the german like weather and climate and stuff like this i mean scorching acid i would like love this to something like like a ceviche or something with like also ripping acid um for mine though i also not just like sour cherry but i also get like kind of like a little like cranberry like a like a tart like cranberry note to it um there's a little bit of like bitterness a little bit of like purple like undertones like slightly but i mean this is just about like well 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 taken care of like tart fruit with a little bit of gas to it and the gas like blows off pretty quickly i think it's just kind of like refreshing on the palate mm -hmm. okay so more about the pinot grape and as i mentioned why it's so difficult to grow so it is early budding early ripening and requires consistent even weather to achieve uh, proper ripeness that's why um paper gunder is named late ripening Oh, you know what? There's another Jerry Maguire reference. It's not in here. It's the Quan. You know what I mean? Pinot Noir has the Quan. The Quan is with an N or with an M. It's one of the two. But anyway, it has, it has that like uh, that special thing to it, where it's kind of like an outfit. I would say where like just because everyone can wear it, not everyone should. It's not meant to be you know grown in all places of the world. Although I'd say everyone loves Pinot Noir so much, just about everywhere in the world tries it, regardless of climate. Uh, super sensitive too. I mean, like the thin skins on it, I mean, you have to have just really ideal growing conditions in the ideal uh, kind of soil. And uh, someone in the comments too also said this is like given a uh, Amazon chocolate rosé a run for its money. I would totally, totally agree with that. And that's like a wine that I think is like loved by all rosé drinkers. And so location is everything. Um, 
especially how earthy and terroir driven the grape is. And if you didn't know, this is also a quote, famous quote from the movie. Yeah, maybe that's like the, the sense of place completing Pinot Noir. Like maybe Tom Cruise is the Pinot Noir and Renee Zellweger is like the, the terroir, the sense of place or maybe terroir if you believe in microbes more so than terroir, but to each their own. Okay. And for the red, this is a really awesome wine. Um, it has some age to it. Uh, which makes it super complex and um, earthy. And it is definitely a little more developed, but the aromatics just really jump out of the glass. Um, it's really nice and intense um, on the nose. And so I think uh, you really do get a lot of that limestone um, coming in. It's that salty kind of savory and herbal notes, um, bit of a dusty kind of, it's yeah. fruity with low alcohol, so you could put this up against things that have a little bit of spice to it. I also think like people generally say like, oh, you just get mushrooms and Pinot Noir out of like Burgundy for the most part, but I get like dried shiitakes on this. I mean, this is really kind of like really uh, like mushroomy for me. It definitely has like a woodsy character to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, sometimes it's good when wines are just fruit expressions and they don't have a lot of these, like secondary like organic like earth elements, but I mean, it's really nice when you can kind of like back up bottle age structure umami yeah that's in the comments like dead on and for me sometimes I, if i get like faint mushrooms in, in burgundy most of the time when i'm calling mushrooms i'm calling like white butt mushrooms or it's like a faint type mushroom i mean this is like the type of mushrooms that i like to eat more than you know something that's like kind of basic like a white, white butt mushroom so, uh nikki what are you getting for earth on this yeah definitely that salty uh, dusty kind of limestone um, that comes through. And then I think the herbal notes are really jumping out. So kind of that celery seed, they're savory and a little green and um, spicy. It's a very, very complex wine. And like 12.5 12, 12 even means too, like if you want to do a lazy person pairing, if you put this with like spicy charcuterie, you want to avoid Pinot Noirs that are clocking in like 14.5 or like higher in alcohol. This is something where I'd feel really good putting it up against like, yeah, maybe even like Induya or like even like Chorizo or just like a little bit of heat to them. Mm -hmm. And so- uh, there's, a, there's a question that asks if this is uh, unfiltered. I mean, it is biodynamic um, and certified in the way their philosophy is um, wine just from grapes. So they very much have an uninterventional approach. And um, you can see there is a little bit of cloudiness in the wine that is from the yeah. filtered and also from the age, I would say. This is done in partially uh, used oak barrel too, but I mean partially partially used can mean different things to different people. It says 15% used oak barrels, but I mean, for me, it's just, I think more texture than actually putting oak flavors in this. And I actually don't need oak flavors in this like whatsoever. There's so much going on. You don't really need to add like vanilla or clove to the mix or anything. Which is more of a classic way that um, Pinot Noir is made in Germany. Um, they want to preserve the freshness of the fruit without covering it as opposed to um, regions like Burgundy, um, where the Grand Cru's have much, much more um, new oak to it. Um, and so I think this is a very classic example because it does show a lot more of that red fruit as opposed to the darker fruit you would find in um, Burgundy. Uh, so it's much more bright on the nose and has uh, all that really bright acidity on the palate. There's like a thing linking all these wines together um for people like looking for like german wines and just like what what can i count on like overall there's like a, a lineage of like acid in all these where you're, you're not none of these like makes you wish the wine was like more tart or like had like more acid i mean and food and food with acid loves wine with acid so i mean i i think that that's something i'm happy about and something that just like sommeliers and non-sommeliers can like geek out about like you need wines to have like I think bracing acidity just to like kind of grab you a little bit. 
So a little bit about the Rhein-Hessen region. Um, it is over here, kind of in that uh, Pinot hotbed. Um, yeah. yeah, you got the whole, uh, if you want to do the pointer again one more time, there's kind of like a whole little like Pinot cluster in like that specific part of Germany. Mm -hmm. And this Western part of the Rheingau as well. Um, but the Rhein-Hessen here, um, they are known for, most famous for the Roterhang, which is um, a premium stretch of land, um, means red hill for its iron so soils. Um, known for Silvaner, which is the most planted grape here than anywhere else in the world. Um, and Liebfraumil, which is similar in style to the Blue Nun that Brent um, described earlier. It's a sweet, cheap, and a mass produced wine, but they're also famous for sugar beets, which in the past they had used to chapitalize um, wines, which is adding sugar so that it can ferment to um, a fully dry wine with higher alcohol, which is no longer used for the most part in quality wine. And so uh, this is again from the southern part here, the Vonnegau within the Rhine-Hessen, um, which is a warmer region within that. Uh, side question for, for you, Nikki, and I'll kind of answer this myself. Um, if you were to blind taste these wines, I can't necessarily say that I've tasted any of these right. Maybe the easiest would be to call that Rosé Pinot Noir, but I mean, these are all pretty unique. And I think like in like a good way, like something doesn't have to be like classic in the way that German Riesling is, which is like amazing, but it's not worth tasting. These are all like, kind of like curveball wines in a good way, like without being like too weird or unconventional or unfinished. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for um, sure. What do, what do you think? If I, if I give all, all these wines to you blind, what are you telling me about them? Blind? Um, yeah, it would be hard to kind of pinpoint, but the, the Pinot Blanc compared to the other regions you find Pinot Blanc from, it's more linear and fresh, and they all have that kind of bright acidity, um, and it's more underripe. Um, the Pinot Gris compared to Alsace um, is lighter and has a fresher acidity and more of a kind of floral note and underripe fruit as well. Um, the Pinot Rosé, I would say, I would say both the Pinots, you would definitely pick out that they are Pinot Noir. And um, the Rosé, yeah, it's definitely, it has a different minerality than Sincere Rosé. That Sincere Rosé is very chalky, but still has a similar underripe um, kind of fruit profile. Um, but that's something that would definitely throw you off is the minerality because it's so unique um, in the Rosé. And then um, the, Red Pinot Noir, I think this is something that if you have um, studied it and have practiced it, it will 100% get you to Germany. I think it's very classic for German Pinot where it sees less new oak and it's more of that savory um, kind of bright red crunchy fruit um, and just super delicious higher acid, just really fr fresh even for an older vintage. And I'm going to ask you the question that we get asked a ton of times, like working at Maxwell and probably it's a fun question, but maybe one of my least like favorite questions to answer. If you had to pick a favorite of these four wines, uh, what are you picking? That is the hard question, um, but I uh, am really in love with this uh, Spett Burgunder, the Pinot Noir. It completes me. Wow, very poetic. Uh, I, I'd, I'd probably say the, the wine that I want to just like go to uh, go to town on and just like really just on like a beautiful weather day like today, just absolutely crush and not like wax poetic on it, probably be like the rose. And I think the thing that I just want to keep going back and trying to find different tones, like notes on, would be like the uh, the Schmidt uh, Schwaber uh, Pinot Noir for me too. So I feel bad because Wines of Germany was nice enough to give us backup bottles of everything in case anything was flawed. So I checked my wines and then I, I took two of the bottles and I, I took your favorite. 
<laughs> so I'm sorry about that. Okay. I'll hold you to that later. That, that and the Marley Loam question, I might owe you lunch for that. <laughs> um, okay, uh, now let's talk about, I, I talked about uh, pairings a little bit too and stuff like this. Uh, tell me like one of the wines out of the four that you would like most want to pair with something right now. Ooh, um, that's a good question. So we have we have this um, smoked salmon dip right now, and I think something like a light red, like this savory Pinot Noir, would go really well with it because it has that acidity, but it won't, and that intenseness on the nose, but it is more of a delicate wine that um, it would pair nicely with the creaminess of the uh, dip that we have um, while still cutting through the richness of it. Um, I think it's just a super super terrible wine for a lot more of uh, the delicate dishes. You know, I I actually might like this backer too is like a maybe a riff on like a cider pairing. Like I like to do orange wines with like cheeses and stuff like uh, Telegio, like what we're like working with and stuff. And I'd really like to see how like the acid would just like kind of cut through like the fat and like how you know, the, again, the tannin and the, the little tannin in this would play off the fat. So I think in terms of like a cheese carrying, like pecker and like some, some riff on brie, like pleasure would be probably pretty cool to mess around with. Uh, the Schmidt, you might also be able to get into like, if you did something with rabbit, it would be cool if you're like throwing the meat in there. I talked about a bunch of different like meats with it. Or if you're vegan, I mean, you could just, you go like mushroom on mushroom there and just <clears throat> cook up a bunch of mushrooms. Um, yeah, Let's the see. And then, Blanc, I think with like a white cream sauce uh, would go really nicely. The texture kind of matches and um, it has a structure um, to stand up to it, like a cacio e pepe, something like that. Yeah, I mean, you could even, let's say, I'd say there's enough like minerality and enough kind of like bracing acid that you could throw I mean, you and I are both fans of, uh, of two Amy's in DC and they do anchovies and butter. You could even throw the peanut blanc maybe against the anchovies and butter. Yeah, for sure. Like that's that's a cool one that just requires like a total palate cleanse here. Mm -hmm. Remember so. to try that. Yeah, yeah. I miss the anchovies and, uh, and butter. Um, then you got the sad Renee Zollinger. Isn't this supposed to be a happy ending? German Pinot. How she feels about Pinot. Yeah, like totally, totally madly in love. Uh, let's see if there's any Q&A and see if there's any Q&A here. Uh, if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the uh, Q&A uh, thing or, or uh, I'll kick it over to Danielle in a little bit and uh, I'm gonna end on one last question for Nikki. If, uh, oh yeah, and we can make sure that you guys uh, will talk to Danielle, I think about getting copies of the slides and all that type of stuff. If you were to tell someone uh, why they should drink more like German wine or what they should explore or, you know, like a favorite producer that you think people should try, like what are you telling people about German wine? Oh, that's a great question. Um, German wine is just, uh, it is one of the most, you know, prestigious and premier wine regions of the world, but you can find such great value and um, really unique and intense wines from um, all over. So um, I would say things, things like Sylvaner is one of my favorite grapes um, and name make beautiful Sylvaner. And I would say it's just a region where you can um, really explore and um, find new, fun and unique styles of wine that maybe you haven't had before. And for the most part at a very like value driven price point. Um, and so um, because it, the lesser known regions aren't quite as well known or quite um, just on the map compared to other places, you can really find um, unique and surprising things. So I think it's really um, worth 
going out and um, trying these different styles of wine and comparing them to more of the classic, classic styles. Um, I, I'll, I'll also go as far to say is like, I think that Germany has almost a way of getting pigeonholed in any, in, as far as like countries of the world uh, to a degree that I haven't seen since like Argentina with like Malbec, where I mean, people just assume like, oh, I've had Malbec tried Argentine wine, people assume I've had Riesling, I've tried German wine. So I, I think that the way they're, they're pigeonholed there, yeah, like these types of wines today, I would happily go out and like buy any of them. Mm -hmm. I also think that and wines in Germany is not making me say that for record too, there, that's a honest opinion. Uh, but I also think to what Nikki's saying, like Silvana and stuff, and not just like laying down German Riesling, because if you've studied wine, I, I think at all, you know that like you can find like a 20 or $30 retail bottle of German Riesling that can age like 10 years and just age beautifully. Um, but I also think the other wines of Germany are also super age worthy too. So something like this, like Schwaper under with that age on it, I mean, this is still going to continue to age pretty well. It still has a lot of primary fruit um, to it. Um, but I also think like I've had 10 year old Hans Viersing, Silvaner and stuff like that. So the thing that I would like pitch to people is like, not only should these be like your everyday wines, but like lay down some Silvaner, like lay down some German Pinot Noir and really try to make it part of uh, the repertoire. And I think that like, if you're misunderstanding like German wine, you're listing a German Riesling on your list and you're not taking it any further. So hopefully this helps with that overall and we didn't have anyone yawn during the history part or anything like that. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, if anyone has anything to add, I don't see anything. I've seen a lot of really cool comments, by the way, but I don't see anything in the Q and A. So, or actually Stefan's been like, just answering these really well too. Uh, well, without further ado, we're gonna turn it over to uh, Danielle. And thanks so much uh, everyone for being here. I really appreciate uh, getting the time to try these wines and talk to you. Uh, thank you for Nikki for putting together these awesome slides and hopefully encouraging some of you to uh, pair up your German wines with watching Jerry Maguire after this. <laughs> thank you guys. Drink more German Pinot. Excellent. Thank you again, Brent and Nikki. Nobody was yawning. They were too busy chatting about the rosé and the Schwefergunder, uh, which we absolutely love to see. So thank you guys again for helping us put this together. And thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, as Steven mentioned, and we talked about on chat, we'll be sending these slides so you guys can reference all of that after the fact. Uh, we also have some tech sheets handy if you're looking for any more technical information on the wines featured here. Uh, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email for me. Yes, another email, apologies in advance. Um, but thank you again for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. We hope to see you at future German Wine From Home events. Thanks, Wines in Germany, Danielle, Stefan, everyone over there too. Thank you guys. Thanks, everyone.